in our system of government. Now that has been turned on its head over the last hundred years or so. Originally, our forefathers, our founding fathers, thought that the juror was so important in our system of justice that they were responsible, it was their duty, to rule on the law as well as on the facts presented in the case. This was something that was, you know, uh, you can see quotes from Adams, from Jefferson, uh, from Patrick Henry. All of them said the same thing. That if you didn't have, if a juror wasn't responsible and didn't have a duty to decide on the law, what was the purpose of having him sit there? Was it to rubber stamp the law? The juror was the final. Steve, how you doing? Yeah. Oh, yeah, glad to see you. I'm sorry, I just got off work. Already, I apologize. I understand. I had a plenty committee for veterans at 6.30, so I'm leaving the end, okay? Steve Parker, our Bowling Springs uh, member from General Seven. Um, anyway, Steve, what we were talking about is the role of the juror in uh, our judicial system. The juror has more of a role constitutionally than he, they're told by the court system now. Up until 1895, they, you know, usually the judges would instruct that the jurors could decide on the law, if the law was just or not. In 1895, there was a case in which the Supreme Court, and I'm sure David will tell you more about it, where someone asked for a jury instruction of that sort, and the judge said no. He didn't get it. They took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said no. The jury doesn't have to hear, have to know that's a, that they have that authority. But they do. Because when you're in a criminal case or in civil case, when you're in, in, in court, if a jury acquits you, you go free. It doesn't matter if you, every bit of the law was against you or not. If the jury says, I'm not going to convict, that's the end of the story, because that was the American system. The problem we have now, that's still the case, but the problem we have now is the jurors are not allowed to be told that by anyone in the courtroom. And the fully, fully informed jury association their mission is basically to tell people and explain to people and instruct people that you do have that authority. The judge can't put you in jail because you don't follow his instructions or the law. Um, we have um, George Bancroft wrote in the history of the Constitution that if a juror accepts the law that which the judge states, then that juror has accepted the exercise of absolute authority of a government employee and has surrendered a power and a right that once was the citizen's safeguard of liberty. It was considered by our founders the juror's role in a, in a judicial proceeding as a safeguard of, of liberty. So we'll, we can, uh, I'll give you just another quote or two uh, and then I'll turn the floor over to David. Um, at the time of the American Revolution, the jury was known to have the power to, both, to be both the judge of both law and fact. In a case involving the civil forfeiture of private property by the state of Georgia, First Supreme Court Justice John Jay instructed jurors that a jury has a right to determine the law as well as the facts in the controversy. That's a case from 1794. One of the things that caused the government to seek and, and, you know, of course, all these are rules that are imposed on us by the American Bar Association and, and the judges, and of course, all the attorneys are members of the ABA, is the Fugitive Slave Act. When the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, of course, it was, uh, was contested. In fact, the state of Wisconsin was going to nullify, nullify it. They said they weren't going to follow it. I see. And there were so many cases where somebody would violate the Fugitive Slave Act, and when they went to court, the jury would not convict. They violated the law. The jury said, no, it's a bad law. We're not going to convict. And government, of course, was outraged by it. They wanted, you know, hey, we passed the law. You've got to convict. Well, what's the difference between that kind of thinking and the king telling the uh, judge in his king's court that, okay, you convict them. It's a, it's a kangaroo court. So anyway, 
I'm going to introduce you now to David Kennison. He's the state, South Carolina State Coordinator for the Fully Informed Jury Association. And one of their missions, and I believe, uh, is to try to uh, inform jurors, but more importantly, to get our representatives, our, our General Assembly, to get behind a bill or a constitutional amendment if it takes that, to have judges inform the jury that they do have this power, not to tell them you know, that they have to follow whatever the law says, he says uh, as the way he states it. Anyway, David, what up? Hey. David Kenson. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, primarily because at one point I'll disagree with, with what uh, I already said. Uh, when he said more importantly was to get legislators to sponsor legislation. Actually, uh, I consider the most important part of our mission to inform the jurors and, and the, the legislators are secondary. <laughs> and uh, maybe the best way of explaining that is to give you just a brief uh, introduction to it myself and my background and why I, what I consider the primary objective, becoming an informed juror, to be the most important. I've always been uh, concerned about uh, public affairs ever since I was a, a teenager, uh, where I, I grew up in an American revolutionary town in New England and, and got my education about American history and the revolution in a, in a museum and library and noted how greatly it contrasted with, with what I was taught in the history books in the, that I was given in the public schools, and that was like the history of two different countries. If you, if you read the history from the people who actually lived it, reading their documents and their letters, or you read the history books, you get two different stories. And that concerned me as a, as a student when I was a, a, in, in junior high and high school, and um, yeah, so that uh, when I went to college, I got, uh, became active in, in um, politics uh, as a young Republican. Uh, I uh, uh, later became active in the draft Goldwater Committee and active in Barry Goldwater's campaign. Uh, and uh, of course, that was an experience that uh, taught me that what you try to do on behalf of individual liberty and, and, and uh, the good of society generally and the political area is so greatly dependent on getting others to go along with you and do it with you. And that sometimes that can be a very disappointing uh, an unrewarding prospect. Uh, Senator Goldwater's wife uh, advised me at the time, pointing out to me that, uh, that uh, with the exception of the Justice Department itself, uh, nobody appeared before the Supreme Court any more than the American Civil Liberties Union. And just as you should be active in uh, 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 political affairs so that you get to say something about who your representatives are, uh, Maybe you ought to try to do something about what the ACLU does when it gets uh, before the court. And so on her advice, I became a member of the ACLU and had been since uh, <coughs> 1964. Um, and uh, in fact, I've recently served 10 years on their national board. However, uh, I encountered a similar problem there. More often than not, uh, I found myself in the minority and, uh, and the majority prevailed and the uh, <coughs> Though I did, in many cases, managed to cobble together some majorities to do some good things on the ACLU board. More often than not, I was in the minority, and, uh, and, and again, like I said, it was worthwhile. But I longed for the ability to do something where I could, where I could be responsible for the outcome myself. I'm sure all of us must do that at times, if not the day before elections, sometimes the day after elections, we, we feel that way, or even sometimes after our candidate is elected and we see what he does in office after a couple of years, we sometimes feel that way. <laughs> so uh, that's why I devote most of my time now in that area to the Fully Informed Jury Association. This is an area where you as a citizen can act by yourself on behalf of individual liberty and the American Law and Constitution, and you can prevail all by yourself against all odds. We have a poster hanging in our office of a picture that appeared on the news several years ago of a man in Tinnerman Square standing before a line of tanks. Brought those uh, red Chinese tanks to a halt, just standing there, one man. And 
that kind of symbolizes what you can do as a juror. As I already correctly explained to you, when you acquit, that's irrevocable. No judge, no Supreme Court. You may have been taught that the Supreme Court has the final say on law. On some matters they do, on others they don't. On others, the jury does, and in fact a single juror can have the final say on whether or not a trial is going to result in, in the conviction of a defendant by voting not guilty, even in the face of the other 11 wanting to vote guilty. Sometimes it turns out, as in the movie that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, 12 Angry Men, where the, the, the juror who wanted to vote guilty manages to convince the other 11 to go along with him, and sometimes it doesn't. And you just stand fast, and, and the jury's hung, and there's no, there's no conviction. And so that's why I, uh, I say that probably one of the most efficacious ways that you can exercise your rights as a citizen is to serve on juries. Sadly, today, many people try to evade jury duty, do everything they can to come up with excuses to evade it. Probably even sadder still, many who don't want to evade it and want to sit on juries aren't allowed to sit on juries. A uh, case that comes to mind recently was uh, uh, the uh, case involving the, uh, the burning of the uh, church that was allegedly a cult, the Branch Davidian Church, a few years ago, and uh, when, when they were selecting jurors, uh, the judge would ask potential jurors, are any of you members of the National Rifle Association? Are any of you members of the ACLU? A couple other organizations? If you belong to either of those organizations or a couple other organizations, you were dismissed. Not allowed to sit on the jury. Um, even now, judges all across the country in all but uh, four states in, in, in many cases, in all but two states in most cases, uh, including South Carolina, often will question the jurors to see if you are informed about your rights as a juror. And if you're informed, they won't let you sit on the jury. So this is why it's so important to know what uh, your, your rights and responsibilities are as a jury. So when you're, when you're trying to educate people contrary to what they may hear from a judge giving them instructions in the courtroom, contrary to what they may have read in their history books in the, in the government schools, uh, or contrary to what we normally call common knowledge, often common knowledge is common but not always knowledge, uh, then it behooves us to try to demonstrate what the roots for that are. And the, and the roots for the jury concept uh, actually go back to before uh, uh, 1066 uh, in, in England where they, uh, the, the jury system was common and there were other parts of the world where it was too. Not as we know it today, but something similar to the jury. But it wasn't until 1215 in, when Magna Carta was signed that it was codified as part of a, uh, a higher law which would govern the application of lower law, similar to our Constitution today in the United States. And, and, and uh, even then, that was not the, what we think of as the jury today. Yes, you were entitled to a jury by your peers, but that is if you were a member of the nobility. But uh, that concept, and, and, and at that time, uh, that entitlement came about by getting a, a, uh, someone to sign a document with, an, with virtually a knife at his throat, which we wouldn't consider legally binding today, and that is some nobles with virtually a knife at the throat of King John got him to sign the Magna Carta, uh, granting them their, their right to uh, be a, tried by a jury of their peers. What is closer to the jury as we know it today, it continued to evolve in, in England until an important case came along involving William Penn in England in 1670. He was a pastor of his church. It was not the, it was not an established church. It wasn't the or one of the churches that was recognized as a religious establishment by the government. Uh, and uh, so he ran afoul of the law. Uh, first they padlocked his church. Uh, so that he couldn't conduct church services. 
and uh, they passed a law saying that you couldn't preach outdoors. Well, he <laughs> preached his sermon in the churchyard because the church was padlocked, and uh, um, he was arrested. If, uh, if he wasn't preaching uh, a religion that was recognized as a proper religious establishment by the British government, the, the English government at the time, and he admitted to breaking the law at trial. The jury uh, voted not guilty, despite the fact that they knew he had violated the law. And they ex explained at the time that, that, that they did so because higher law trumped the law of the, that he had supposedly violated. Some of them referred to the higher law as God's law. Others referred to it as natural law. It really didn't matter what it was. They had this concept that higher legal principles could trump a law even if the law was still on the books and even if the judge told you that the law was legitimate. Uh, these were a rare band of jurors. They were the judge told the jury to change their verdict to guilty or he would find them in contempt. They still refused, so he sent them to prison for civil contempt for refusing to obey the judge's order to render a guilty verdict. Uh, incidentally, their conditions under their contempt proceeding were a little harsher than what we normally think of. They, they were not given toilet facilities or food or water for several days. And they still refused. Eventually, uh, their right to refuse to follow the judge's instruction and their right to acquit in the teeth of the law, so to speak, um, without being punished for um, violating the judge's instructions was upheld by a, a superior court in England at the time. And that established the principle that jurors cannot be punished for their verdict. That they don't even have to explain their verdict. They give their verdict and that's it. That they don't have to tell the court how they reached their verdict. They don't have to explain it, justify it. Their verdict stands and it cannot be overturned if it's acquittal. Now a guilty verdict can be overturned, of course, because the judge can, uh, an appellate court can rule that, that the lower trial court proceeded improperly, that the police acted improperly, that the prosecutor acted improperly, you know, various reasons can be overturned. So that when it comes to, uh, when it comes to guilty verdicts, uh, what you were taught is right. The Supreme Court does have the final say. But when it comes to not guilty verdicts, you have the final say. That's what's so important about uh, our role as jurors. Well, how did that come to this country? Well, in the next case that comes to mind is in, in 1735. Now, this is a case that I was taught of in, in, in uh, my government history course in, in the government schools in Connecticut, uh, the Peter Zenger case. Only I was taught that it was about the First Amendment, about freedom of the press. Uh, superficially, that is what it was about. Uh, Peter Zenger published a newspaper. Uh, and uh, he uh, has some unkind things to say about the governor, the, the governor of New York. And uh, the English law that governed in the colonies at that time uh, made libel a, cr a crime. It also defined libel as intentionally publishing anything that would harm the reputation of the person who published it. And it specifically stated that it didn't matter whether what you published was true or false. If you delivered, if you did it with the intent of harming the person's reputation, that was libel. Truth is no defense, in other words. His lawyer, Andrew, Andrew Hamilton, no, no relation to Alexander. Andrew Hamilton attended the first law school in the United States, which was the building in which the museum resided that I learned of my history of in Litchfield, Connecticut, when I was a, a child. But uh, Andrew Hamilton uh, asked the jury to find him not guilty, despite the fact that he had violated the libel law. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, published without a license because they, they, they took 
took away his license to publish a newspaper, which he supposedly had to have in New York at that time, if they wanted to continue to hear the truth, find out what, what their public officials were up to, they should find him not guilty, despite the fact that he had violated the law. And the jury did find him not guilty, and he continued to publish his newspaper. And that was uh, taught as a First Amendment case. Well, obviously that case was in the minds of people who wrote the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. But if you think about it, what that case is really about is the power of jurors to uh, acquit contrary to the instructions of the judge. Either, either the explicit instructions to find the defendant guilty, as in the, in the uh, William Penn case in England, or the uh, implied instructions where the judge told them that uh, they could not regard the truth of the publication as a defense against libel. And that, uh, that if he admitted publishing what was, what was published, and if it did, in fact, damage the reputation of the governor, then uh, they, it was their, their, their duty and responsibility, and he even told them, and you have sworn an oath to find him guilty, to obey my instructions. Well, they, uh, fortunately, that jury recognized that, that, an, that an oath granted under, under duress is not binding, and so they went ahead and found him not guilty. And that, prior to the revolution, established the principle. After the revolution, and I, which I want to stop and make note of for a moment here because it's the American Revolution is central to the concept of a fully informed jury. But after the revolution there were a few cases which you mentioned, uh, one by name and another without me a minute and I'll, I'll briefly mention those again. But first I want to point out that what makes th uh, this country unique and our revolution unique and in some sense, it's one of the true revolutions in the history of the world. Because when you think about it, most revolutions aren't much different from elections. It's just that they're done by violence instead of by peaceful means. You know, that you just change over who wields the power. And they call that a revolution if it's done with violence, and they call it an election if it's done at the ballot box. But it, it, the result of both is you just change the, the heads. You, you, Fundamental change rarely occurs as a result of those things. Uh, often, uh, even when fundamental change is in the hearts and minds of the people who shed the blood and risked their lives to bring the revolution about, it, it often doesn't, doesn't bear fruit. Sometimes, sometimes they don't even change the faces. They just change their titles or the party they belong to, kind of like the Putin in, in Russia. The same guy's in charge, only now he's no longer considers himself a communist, but he's still in charge, and the same people are still in charge of the bu bureaus, and the same corruption is still there, and so on. The American Revolution was different because it took the whole concept of the relationship between you, the cit individual citizen in the government, and turned it on its head with respect to that which is our central a focus of concern, namely liberty and human rights. Prior to the American Revolution, the concept of, uh, the, of the English had, when they talked about the rights of Englishmen, they thought the rights were things that you got the king to grant you, either by putting a sword to his throat or by more peaceful means. But nevertheless, they were granted to you by the government. Something that we would probably call today license rather than rights. The government gives you a license to do something that you you don't have an absolute right to do when you get permission to do it. Um, but the concept of rights behind the American Revolution is, was based on natural law. The idea that, that you possess rights as an individual just because you're a person. That it's inherent in the nature of a person that you have rights. It doesn't matter it, in most cases, at least for cases involving children and teenagers and adults and so on, it doesn't matter whether you believe that the source of those natural rights was that you were endowed by them by, a, by, a, by your God, by putting a soul in, 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 in you and because you have a human soul that means you have human rights, or whether you believe that the that human rights are a natural process of, of your evolution as an individual and a species, as an, as an individual capable of exercising choice and deciding whether to take course A or course B. 
And when you have the power to make that choice based on your assessment of the conditions, the, the natural uh, concomitant of that is that you have the right to act according to your choice rather than somebody else's choice. So whether you think that natural rights are, are the result of, of uh, being endowed with those rights by, by, a, by a God, or whether you think that they're just a natural concomitant of the nature, of your nature as a human being, from a legal perspective, and as I say, in most cases, where the individual, where well, there's no question that the person is a person, uh, it doesn't matter. And so the, the, what, both schools of thought come under what we call natural rights theory. The, the, it's, it's inherent in your nature as a human being that you have rights. So the, the, our founders, when they went to set up a, a new order, didn't say, what rights will we give people? What rights should this new government say people have? Instead, they said, what rights do we have? And what should we do to safeguard those rights from the government? And if you read the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, except for the, the uh, Articles 1, 2, and 3 laying out what the powers of the branches are, uh, most, of the, most of it is not about what powers the government has, but about what powers the government doesn't have, because we have rights. And even when it comes to the powers, it's not, whereas previously it was considered that the king was all powerful by divine right, to do whatever he wanted, and if he chose not to exercise the power, that was his choice. If he chose to, to grant us a so-called right by not exercising the power, that was the government's choice. This was the other way around. The American government was to have no power unless the people gave that power to the government. Because since governments have no rights, states have no rights, only individual human beings have rights, then only individual human beings can grant powers to the government rather than the other way around. So this was unique about the American Revolution. And Jefferson recognized this. And as you probably are aware, Jefferson wasn't, strictly speaking, one of the founders of the Constitution. He didn't participate directly in the Constitutional Convention or the writing of the Constitution. And he was rather skeptical about whether it was going to succeed, as were some observers from France and other parts of the world that, that were afraid that this great American experiment might not work. And Jefferson noted, though, in, 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 in in support of the new system, that the most important, which he considered to be the fourth branch of government, the most important branch of government was the jury. That the jury system was the best safeguard that our Constitution provided to protect our liberty as individuals. And he meant to protect our liberty from any source, not just from a tyrannical king, but even from a tyrannical majority. You remember that uh, uh, one of the major concerns of our founders was that uh, we not subject ourselves to a greater tyranny on this side of the Atlantic than we were trying to escape on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, to that end, uh, people like George Washington refused to become king. Didn't want to didn't want to have a monarchy in this country, and likewise, our our institutions are called democratic because they use the democratic process to make decisions, but only the decisions they're allowed to make as a, as, by a democratic process. The main function of the Constitution is to tell us what we cannot do by simple majority, and in some cases what we can't even do with a two-thirds majority. But to protect us against all forms of tyranny, including the tyranny of the majority. That's one of the reasons that Jefferson found the jury system so attractive, that a single juror could prevent an individual being deprived of his liberty. Because when you think about it, there's an exception to our, to our honoring the rights of individuals inherent in the very nature of government that is part even of the American government, the American Revolution. You might say you have a natural right as a person to X, Y, and Z. But there is a, an accepted and lawful way for you
you to be deprived of those rights. What is that? Anybody know? To be convicted of a crime by due process of law. The minute you're convicted of a crime, you lose a whole bunch of rights. Not all of them, but you lose a whole bunch. So, people like Jefferson were wise enough to realize that if the American experiment was, were going to fail, it probably wouldn't have failed, wouldn't fail in a blatant, outright manner. Let's reverse this. Let's do away with natural rights. Let's not respect the rights of man. Let's go back to having a, a, a tyrannical tyrant or a, a mobocracy, rule of a simple majority. And it wouldn't happen that way. But the way that would happen is that if somebody wanted to violate your rights, they pass a law. They make a new law. Making, they would invent a new crime. Something that wasn't a crime before. It wasn't, it wasn't a crime because it was naturally against your rights as an individual, like murder and theft and things like that. It would be a crime just because they said so. And then when you violated that law, you'd be, become a criminal and you would no longer become a, recognized as having rights as a person. You'd be stripped not only of your, uh, of your unnatural constitutional rights, like the right to vote, that's an artificial right. That's because we vote. And now because you're a citizen, you have a right to vote. But your natural right, like your right to life, liberty, and property, you can be stripped, be stripped of those as well. Simply because you violate a law, a statute that is not, doesn't follow naturally, it's not an extension of natural law, but it's enacted by legislators. Don't do this. And now we even have a case before the Supreme Court, they started arguing today, to make it a crime, not because you did something that you were told not to do, but because you don't do something that you're told to do. Uh, namely, buy insurance. you must buy insurance or if that's against the law. Uh, it's just like mandatory auto car Pardon insurance. Me? They started like mandatory car insurance. We fought that in Texas for 20 years and they've had Well, it, 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 that, it's, it's like it, but it's also unlike it. The difference is that, that um, all you have to do to fall under the mandatory requirement to buy uh, health insurance is B. Is free? Mm. <laughs> you have to be. You have to be, uh, be here. That's it. Whereas, whereas uh, you're not required to buy car insurance unless you choose to there drive used to on be uninsured public motorists. motorists. There used to be uninsured motorists. If you're worried about someone crashing into you, you could buy uninsured motorists. But and now you're required to buy car insurance in all 50 states because of the... Yeah, yeah, what you say, of if you want to drive a car, but you don't necessarily have to drive a car. You can walk if you want to. Well, you can have a moped, too. Who are you going to kill for a moped? But in a motorcycle, a motorcycle... You yeah. but the, the point I'm making is that Why should you there, are sim buy a there are similarities, but the analogy doesn't hold. Uh, and at what price? What if they make car insurance $2,000 a month? Mm -hmm. you know, at what point, at what price does that stop? But the point is that, that I still, it's kind of like sales tax. I still have to go buy something in order to be subject to the sales tax. I still have to ride on the public roads in order to be, or have my vehicle driven on the public roads, whether I'm the one driving it or not, uh, in order to be required to have the liability insurance. And, and, and now the rationale is similar. It is similar. The rationale is very similar, but the difference is that that in the case of the health insurance, you don't have to do anything to be subject to that mandate. You don't have to buy a car. You don't have to. That was, that all was, you have to do is breathe air. Yeah. That was brought up when mandatory car insurance. Yeah. When's it going to stop? Yeah. When's it going to stop? Oh, yeah. Now it's, that's, it's, that's a good point. Well, I did want to point, though, that there, there, there's an important difference there. But let's not get off. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but this concept that then became came unique to American law uh, is what American jurors would, would have to uh, bring with them into the courtroom. And of course, jurors in the, at the time of the revolution pretty much do this. They didn't have to learn it by, from their history books. They lived it, so they, so they knew that this is what they were there for. Uh, and they walked into a courtroom, and they recognized that even if a person violated a statute, 
if that statute were either A, contrary to natural law, or B, contrary to the Constitution, it was their duty to vote not guilty. They knew that. In fact, um, you mentioned the, uh, not by name, but the, 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 the case of Georgia versus Brailsford uh, in 1794. Uh, now that was a jury trial conducted by the United States Supreme Court. They don't do that anymore. They had to do it back then because uh, the legislature, you know, kind of slow sometimes getting things done. They hadn't gotten around to setting up the, the appropriate district and appellate courts of jurisdiction to handle the case. So the only court that could, the, the Supreme Court had to take original jurisdiction of the case. So they conducted a jury trial in the United States Supreme Court. The Chief Justice was one of our founders, John Jay. And I want to, and I, when I've had occasion to act on my own behalf in a South Carolina court in the jury trial, I've gone to the trouble of memorizing Chief Justice Jay's charge to the jury. I memorize it because there's some judges in South Carolina that won't let you read to the jury. If you, can't, if you can't speak it without reading it, you're not allowed to read it to the jury. So I would memorize it. And, and in my summation to the, uh, of my defense, uh, after asking the jury to pay due deference and respect to what the judge char charges them to listen to how Chief Justice Jay charged the first jury. And I can do that in South Carolina because I'm not an attorney. If I were an attorney and I did that, I'd probably get called up before the Bar Association and the judge would probably find me in contempt. But he couldn't stop me from doing it because I'm not an attorney, so I was able to let the jury know how the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court was one of the founders charged the jury. And I won't use the entire quote. Uh, I, I don't remember it right now. I, I would brush up on it if I were going to court. But let me read to you one uh, paragraph of that. It is presumed that the juries are the best judges of facts. It is, on the other hand, presumed that the courts are the best judges of law. But still, both objects are within your province of decision. You have a right to take upon yourself to judge of both and, and to determine the law as well as the fact in controversy. In the longer quote, he goes on to, you know, why they should pay attention to the learned justices of the Supreme Court, so on and so forth, but then to emphasize that still it's their responsibility in the end to make their own judgment. Uh, and if you care to look that up, it's 1794, Supreme Court case, Georgia versus Brailsford, and it's, a, I think, a very important part of history for everybody to know. Uh, 1794, <coughs> still in the revolutionary period, and on up and through the periods that, uh, I, I, I won't go over that, that but Art mentioned them to you, and I'm sure you're familiar with them, that, that many juries refuse to convict people for being part of the Underground Railroad. Um, one of my great-great-great-grandfathers uh, uh, was actually acquitted three times by three separate juries <laughs> for, for participating in the Underground Railroad, uh, even though in all three cases he admitted that he had violated the law. Uh, and I would say up until about 150 years ago, the jury played an uh, uh, very increasingly important part in securing our liberties in this country, and, and jurors pretty much knew what their prerogatives were. Uh, and about 150 years ago, things started to turn. It was around uh, the, another case you mentioned, 1895, the Supreme Court, where a defendant tried to claim he didn't have a fair trial because the jury wasn't, the, the judge refused to let the jury know that they could judge the law in the case as well as the fact. And the Supreme Court said, well, he was, he was correct. The defendant's uh, legal team was correct. The jury did have that right. But then he also said, but they don't have a right to know they have that right. <laughs> well, now, that might offend you as a juror, but if you're a defendant, 
it ought to really offend you. Because what that means is, that as a defendant, the Supreme Court was saying, even though jurors have a right to be fully informed of their right to acquit you, and even under that interpretation, their responsibility to acquit you, you as a defendant don't have a right to be tried by informed jurors. If they're uninformed, tough luck. Kind of a, you know, it's one of those Supreme Court cases that when you read it, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. In fact, it must have left the bad taste in the mouth of the uh, uh, justices of the D.C. Court of Appeals in 1972 when they were forced to uh, uphold that precedent set by the Supreme Court from another defendant who was arguing he didn't have a fair trial. And uh, a district court judge uh, um, uh, had handled that case, and the appellate course in, appellate course in D.C., I uh, thought it was time to do something, and that uh, uh, the Constitution, interpretation of the Constitution trumps stare decisis. Everybody know what stare decisis is? The principle of, uh, of, of judicial practice that says that if, uh, if a law has been in effect for a long time and considered constitutional and proper for a long period of time, even if it was, even if it were improperly decided in the first place, if it's been around for a long time, it gets grandfathered in and we accept it as being constitutional. We don't overturn it. Uh, two of the leading proponents of those two schools who are often thought to be clones of each other, and they certainly are not on the Supreme Court today, are uh, uh, Justice Anthony Scalia and, and Justice Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas takes the position, he doesn't care if the Supreme Court made a mistake in 1794. If it was a mistake, it's the job of today's court to correct it. Whereas Scalia would say, if it's been around for a long time, it's going to cause a lot of readjustment in society to make the correction, we'll just live with that mistake. And, and that's called stare decisis. Once the, the decision is made, it, it will stand, even if it's wrong. Now, if it's a recent error, someone like Scalia is more prone to overrule it, but if it happened a long time ago, even if he disagrees with it, he will tend not to vote to overrule it. Who determines the length of time? <laughs> it's very subjective. It's a combination of how long ago was it and how, how much has it impregnated society. It has become so commonplace that it would be disruptive to make the correction disruptive in the sense that a lot of people would have to readjust their plans and change their plans and everything then, then, uh, and how they live their lives and so on. Or if it would mean that we suddenly have to release 3,000 people from prison. <laughs> oh, we, we can't do that. We'll just leave them in there. Just 3,000? What is an example of one that can change? Well, an example of where, where they're reluctant to do something that would result in releasing a lot of people from prison right here in South Carolina. In fact, I was involved in uh, and this was involved, a lot of judges either act as if they don't know, or perhaps even don't know, that, uh, that the Supreme Court has asserted time and time again that the right to trial by jury uh, is absolute for any finding of, crimin of criminality, including criminal contempt of court. In fact, the Supreme Court said especially criminal contempt of court. It's even more important that you have a right to a jury to determine whether you're guilty or not guilty of contempt than it is guilty or not guilty of murder. Because after all, the judges who are finding you guilty are the ones who are offended by your appeal. I mean, they're, they're the ones that you're, that you're, uh, you're deprived of your liberty. And if, for them to sit in, in, in judgment over that, uh, is even more egregious than if than if judges who are not a not part of the a party to see another the judge is party to a contempt he, he, he's the one that you were contemptuous of but the judge is not party to the murder so you can say that the judge is an objective third party if he finds you guilty of murder without a jury trial and that's certainly unconstitutional but the supreme court said it's even worse if he can sit there and find you guilty of contempt of him without a jury trial although they did say that if the maximum penalty allowable by law for the offense is less than six months, you don't get a 
federal guarantee of a jury trial. Now, South Carolina will actually guarantee a jury trial for some things for less than six months. So that's, that's pretty nice in South Carolina. But uh, the federal guarantee under the U.S. Constitution uh, only applies if it's punishable, not punished by, but punishable by oh, six months or more. And uh, several years ago, the, con the statute for criminal contempt in South Carolina allowed a, uh, allowed a, uh, a lower court judge, like a family court judge, for example, to find you guilty of criminal contempt for a year. He, not just, he doesn't just cite you for contempt, he finds you guilty of contempt, too. Well, under the U.S. Constitution, even though the South Carolina law at that time said that he could find you guilty of contempt, all he really had the power to do is cite you for contempt like a traffic officer cites you for speeding, writes you a ticket, and then uh, you, you, get, you, you can either be indicted by a grand jury or have a prosecutor file an information and be tried in General Sessions Court for being in contempt of the family court judge. Uh, and uh, uh, at the time, the South Carolina... Supreme Court didn't want to handle that case because they knew that if they ruled against the appeal, that the U.S. Supreme Court would overturn them. And if they ruled for it, that uh, uh, there were probably thousands of people in South Carolina who were in prison for criminal contempt who would have to instantly be released. <laughs> and that was kind of a very disruptive thing to do. So they practiced another interesting form of stare decisis. As this involved a family court matter, and family court matters become moot sometimes when somebody turns 18, they just sat on the case and waited until the person turned 18. And they said, oh, this case is moot. We don't have to rule on it. Uh, so that, that's, that's an example right here in South Carolina. What was that uh, Supreme Court case in 1995 that uh Take the point that the jury had the right to turn over the line back. You see, I can't remember the. I've got it. I've got it. Yeah, I was trying to trip you up. I was just curious about it. Yeah. By the way, any questions you have on the sign up sheet, put your question and we'll it send was, you information on it. It was SPARF. SPARF, that's it. SPARF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. SPARF, uh, SPARF versus Hanson, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, 1895. Yeah. Upheld as late as 1972. But listen to what the judge said in 1972. It's obvious that the judge had that same bad taste, the D.C. Court of Appeals judge had that same bad taste in his mouth that I got when I read the Supreme Court. So before saying that he was bound by the Supreme Court to deny the appeal, he said the following. He said, unreviewable and irreversible power to acquit and disregard the instruction of the law by the trial judge. The pages of history shine upon instances of the jury's exercise of his prerogative to disregard instructions of the judge. For example, acquittals under the fugitive slave law. And he said a lot more things. He waxed eloquent about how important it was, the, the role the jury played, and then said, oh, but I have to, I'm, you know, I'm bound by the Supreme Court <laughs> to say that the defendant's conviction cannot be overturned. That was in 1972. And that's where the law is today. What that means is that you, as a potential defendant, uh, cannot rely on the courts or the U.S. Supreme Court, unless it reverses itself someday, to safeguard your right to be tried by jurors who are not only free to, but also knowledgeable to exercise, not only free to exercise their rights and duties as jurors, but also knowledgeable of what those rights and duties are. The current cases, they have to be free, but they don't have to have the knowledge to exercise that freedom. That's a, that's a threat hanging over all our heads as potential defendants, but it's also a challenge to each of us as potential jurors. Because if we know what our right is, we don't have to hear it from the judge. Now today, some state, if you're in Indiana, for example, the judges have to tell you that you have that right. Why? Because in Indiana, they actually put it right in the Constitution <laughs> that the jurors will be informed of their right to judge both the law and the fact. That the defendant has a right to a trial by a jury that's informed of both of its right to judge both the law and the fact. Uh, there's a similar provision in Georgia 
though it's commonly only upheld in, in, in regarded in libel cases uh, in, in a couple other states uh, where it only happens when a knowledgeable defense attorney makes a motion for it, and without the defense attorney making a motion for it, the judges usually don't bother to, to tell it to the jury. With the exception of four states, we now have uh, 46 out of, the, uh, out of 50 states where the judges actually misinform the jury when they charge the jury. When they tell the jury that they are bound to follow court's interpretation of the law, that is misinformation. But that's what commonly happens even today in our courts in South Carolina. Not in all of them, but a few judges in South Carolina who, 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 who know better and, and they're not told that they can't tell the jurors their rights, and so they do inform the jurors of their rights. There are, you know, there are a few judges who do that, uh, I'm proud to say, in South Carolina. But most judges don't. And they're not required to by the uh, Supreme Court, state Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, um, the only thing that might change that to get into the secondary role of Fiji in South Carolina is if, is if the legislature were to uh, 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 set a constitutional amendment before us here in South Carolina to insert into our Constitution, as they have in, in Indiana, for example, the uh, the requirement that jurors be informed of their right to judge both the law and the facts of con in controversy, just as Chief Justice Jay <coughs> charged the courts in, in, uh, in, in the Brailsford in case in 1794. But that high, that's kind of a high point in history. And now it's uh, less than <coughs> I'd say in the, in the last 150 years, uh, the role of the jury began to decline. It began to decline as more and more jurisdictions and more and more judges would, you know, neglect, neglect to t first neglect to tell the jurors that they should judge the law and the facts, as Chief Justice Jay did. He said, even, even, even though I want you to respect my opinion, I'm reminding you it's your duty to make your own judgment. That was Chief Justice Jay. What gradually happened is the judges started to not bother to tell the jurors that anymore, and even got around to where they actually misinformed the jurors and tell them the opposite in a lot of jurisdictions today. And so, 150 years ago, the effectiveness of the jury in safeguarding our liberties began to decline. And probably about halfway through that period, about say 75 years ago, I would say that American liberty probably reached its high point took a while for that to take effect, and there were some good things going on, but uh, I, I feel as if today uh, I enjoy less liberty as an American citizen than my colonial ancestors did under George III, uh, under colonial America, because of a lot of things that have happened. And unfortunately, if the jury, if jurors had remained informed, it probably wouldn't have happened. Yes, we could have had more political awareness in our legislatures that could have offset a lot of things that have happened to diminish our liberty since that time. But the problem is that the cause of liberty is, is, doesn't belong to any political party or any political persuasion. With all the experience that I've had dealing with a lot of these cases, I've, whenever we try to get something done in, in one of the legislatures about this, we always have bipartisan support tough part is to get a majority in either party. <laughs> but we always have bipartisan support. It isn't a left-right thing. It's not a Republican or Democrat thing. Uh, I, I, I sat between two board members of Fiji, had a, a, two of the nicest people I've ever met. On one side of me was a person who was staunchly pro-life on, on the abortion issue, and another one that was staunchly pro-choice on the abortion issue. Both of them wanted to make sure this. In, in some case, either an abortion doctor or maybe a, 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 a someone demonstrating against an abortion doctor, either one, who violated the statute, they both wanted to make sure that the, a juror 
might know that that person, the conviction could be blocked by a juror refusing to vote guilty. So it doesn't, it doesn't, fully informed jury doesn't favor conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat, left or right. It just, what it favors is liberty and it favors how error will occur in our society. No system is perfect and it never will be. There'll never be a perfect judicial system. It's going to make mistakes and it's going to make errors. But we have to decide which error concerns us more. A guilty person getting turned free or an innocent person going to prison or being executed. If you care about individual liberty as I do, you're willing to let several guilty people go free rather than see an innocent person go to the chair or go to, go to prison. If you want to err on the side, those who would rather err on the side of liberty, it doesn't matter whether you're liberal, conservative, Republican, or Democrat. If you want to err on the side of personal and individual liberty, I can think of no greater uh, and more effective way to achieve that than to serve as an informed juror and to do what you can to see that as many South Carolinians as possible are informed so that if they ever sit on your jury, or a jury of a member of your family or, or a friend, that there'll be at least one informed juror sitting on that jury. That high point, as I say, uh, about 150 years ago, uh, started downhill with that 1895 case, <coughs> and then a DC Court of Appeals case. But the, this, the importance of, of the role of the juror and the importance of Fiji's mission is all tied into the concept of what is the purpose of the jury. Why do we have juries anyway? What, what is the function of the jury? Anybody? What, what do you think the main purpose of the jury is in our system? To be judged by a group of peers. To be judged by your peers? That's a good description of, of what it does. But why? Why be judged by your peers instead of well, you, you're judged by a group, so you have a decision-making group, so you spread that out to the, to the agreement, and not just one person making that decision on how they feel at the moment, but you have agreement over a larger group of people. Well, there were two groups in the Brailsford case. Nine of them were eminent jurists, and yet they chose not to judge the case. They left it up to 12 common citizens. Why? They're looking for the truth, I think. Hmm. I wonder, if it's, is it just the truth? Is it just proper identification of the facts and the truth? Think about it. If you're on trial in a complicated case, would you rather have the average 12 people picked off the street to, to determine what the facts were in the case? Or expert scientific technical minds, expert in the facts about the particular case at hand? Who could do a better job of determining the facts? Probably the experts. What do you, what do you think the main purpose of the jury is? I think. I, I, I'm trying to remember to go back. I think it was Brandeis who said it was it was to dilute uh, bias. It does more than prejudice. It does more than dilute bias. It allows one juror to trump the bias of eleven, doesn't it? But supposedly the eleven are going to outnumber the one. But supposedly. the one. But the one. If the one says you're not guilty, the, the, you cannot be deprived of your rights and thrown in prison and fined and right. deprived of your property and executed. Purpose thing is just to stand in the way of government being overly intrusive, and it gives sort of another uh, another obstacle for the government to overcome. Well, I think the founders give you an A plus <laughs> because they were all a lot of them were technocrats. Jefferson was prep with you know was was a pretty good amateur biologist, physicist. I mean, he, a lot of so, so was Ben Franklin. A, a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the people who founded this country were were highly educated. People with, who, who knew that, that the average person didn't know much about how to determine what was true or false in a case, but they still would rather have the average person off the street for the very reason that you said, or as Jefferson said, that the jury was the best safeguard of liberty to be found anywhere in the Constitution. As he, he, he called it the fourth branch of government. <laughs> to protect us from the other three. <laughs> now, With that in mind, I would like to go over a list of how much more time do we have? We have, uh, we have probably half hour. Half hour, okay. 
probably plenty, and then I'll take some questions from you. I'd like to briefly go over a list of, of, of things that, that we would prescribe that uh, you as a juror keep in mind. I want to give you the background first, because since this idea is contrary to common notion of what a jury is supposed to do, most people think a jury is supposed to judge facts. Leave all the legal questions up to the judge. Uh, but I, I wanted to at least let you realize there's a credible challenge to that notion. And that if, and if that notion is false, that uh, a nasty trick has been played on the American Revolution, and, it's, and, and if we want to preserve it, we need to do what we can to turn things back around. We're down to, like I said, we're down to four states left out of 46, still hanging on to the original notion of what a jury trial is. Uh, before it gets down to zero, I'd like to see the trend go the other way and see some, some states restore trial by jury to what it is. And, but, in, but with or without the help of the instructions from the judge, this is basically what we're saying. When you come, it's time for you to render your verdict. In a case where the defendant admits or where the evidence proves beyond any reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the act that he is accused of, okay, so you still should vote not guilty in the following cases. One, if either the statute which prohibits the act that he committed is contrary to natural law or contrary to the Constitution, then you should regard that law as null and void. Well, in fact, the Supreme Court has often said that laws that are contrary to natural law or the Constitution are null and void. But the problem is, in this particular case, only you are there to make that decision. Is it contrary to natural law? Is it contrary to the Constitution? If you believe that the law is unconstitutional, you should vote to acquit, regardless of what the facts in the case are. Uh, that puts you in the position of having to interpret, doesn't it? What does the Constitution mean? And that means that in order for you to be a, quote, good citizen, if part of being a good citizen means being a good juror, it's incumbent upon you to consider, to, to, to school yourself on how to interpret. Uh, many people would say, oh yeah, I'm a strict constructionist, I want to pull the Constitution. But there are two very disparate schools of thought on what that means today. Um, one party would say, yes, the, the words of the Constitution and a statute, when measuring it up against the words of the Constitution, the words of the Constitution should always be interpreted according to the original intent of the founders. Those are the strict constructionists who say that they want to support original intent. And there's another school that says the text, the words of the Constitution should always be interpreted according to the original meaning of the text of the Constitution. <coughs> you might think that's a subtle distinction, but I will tell you that it's not, and that the distinction between the two is at the very core of what the American Revolution was about. Because the core was not just about natural law and establishing the higher law in terms of the Constitution. It was about something even more important. You've probably heard this phrase a lot, the rule of law. The American Revolution was about being ruled by law, not by men. By a constitution, not by a king. Okay? By a statute, not by a policeman or a prosecutor or a judge. The rule of law. But what is law? Is the law what somebody intended it to be? Or is it what it is? It, it, is, it, is it the words? I would recommend anybody becoming a Supreme Court justice, but to any citizen, I would recommend Antonin Scalia's book, A Matter of Interpretation. Now, I disagree with Scalia on a lot of things. But I agree with him so much on his manner of on his his theory of judicial interpretation that often when I disagree with his decisions, it's because he violated his own his own book. His own book. <laughs> <laughs> if he stuck to this, he'd, be, he'd he'd get it right almost every time. Scalia is an advocate of what's called original textualism, and he points out that this doctrine of an original intent is foolishness. First of all. 
It's the intent of men. We're not going to, we didn't set up the, this country so we'd be ruled by men, not the founders or anybody else. It was for rule of law. And as for what did the words mean, trying to find out what the words mean by finding out what the, the intention was of the, of the founders. Well, who are the founders anyway? Are they the people who sat in the convention in Independence Hall and drafted the words? Or are they the members of the state legislature who uh, considered whether or not to ratify? The ratifiers. Who actually made it? Who actually made it the concept? It wasn't the, what we normally think of as the founders, was it? It was the members in the states who ratified it, the ratifiers. Well, how are we going to find out what the original intent of the ratifiers are, or the founders, or anybody else? That's not only a rule of men, that's being ruled by dead men who aren't even here to tell us if we got it wrong when we try to tell what, what their intent was. What are we going to have? 21st century psychologists and psychiatrists and uh, legal scholars telling us what was what the founders or the ratifiers really meant to say, even though that isn't what they put down in text. They really meant to do this instead. Those, that kind of pernicious doctrine, uh, Scalia rejected that uh, in, the, in the minority, in the Kelo case. Everybody familiar with the Kelo case recently, where the Supreme Court ruled that when the, when the Constitution says that you can be deprived of your property against your will, as long as you're given just compensation for it, under the eminent domain clause, as long as the property is for, for a what? Public use. Well, the majority in the court said they didn't mean use, they really meant purpose. And one of the purposes of government is to raise taxes. Therefore, if I can take the property away from you against your will, and then sell it to you, and because of the use you're going to make of the property, more I money, can collect more, more taxes, taxes from you, then that's a public purpose, so I can take your property against your will. Well, up until that Kelo decision came along, public purpose was <coughs> things like roads and schools and you know, things like that. Now public purpose can be, I just want the way you're going to use the property, the way you're going to use the property, the way you're going to use it will let me collect more taxes from you. And that's one of my purposes as, as a city government or a county government or a state government is to collect taxes. That's what, so they, they decided that, they really, that the founders really intended, or the ratifiers really intended to say purpose rather than use. They just made a, they made a typographical error. And so now you can be deprived of your property by a 5-4 Supreme Court decision which the majority supposedly was following what they believed to be the original intent. So you see how the doctrine of original intent might not go the way you think it will. Now what about the words? Well, the words that matter in a law, what the, the, the interpretation of the words that should matter, isn't even the interpretation of the ratifiers or the founders or the legislature. When, when you pass a law in the state legislature, is it what the words meant to the legislature that matter? He's not the one on trial. If you're going to be convicted of breaking a law, it better be what the words ought to mean to a reasonably intelligent citizen who's accused of breaking the law. The phrase in the Supreme Court touches the long history of the concept of the rule of law rather than men. It includes Hammurabi's Code, which was one of the first times that law was to be written so that people would have a chance to know what the law was before they were accused of violating it. Uh, it includes the last half, the non-religious half of the Ten Commandments, the part about thou shalt not kill and steal and so on. That's on the freeze. It includes uh, part of, uh, uh, of uh, Islamic law that has to do with non-religious legal things. Those are all on the freeze of the Supreme Court. To, to recognize the history of this concept of rule of law. That principle rule of law is probably the, the, the rock bed of our society. That we're not to be ruled by other people, but by law. And law is expressed in words, not in feelings or emotions of people who raised their hand or voted yay or nay when the statute was enacted, but the words that they enacted. 
And when you're a legislator, if you enact the law, you better pick the right words because the law is going to be the words you pick, not what you intended. If you follow Scalia's interpretation, and which I would recommend you do, because otherwise we don't have rule of law. We have rule of men instead of rule of law. So this idea then that if the, that if the conviction runs contrary to, to what the text of the Constitution or principles of natural law mean to, and now what it mean to whom? And this is where Scalia's theory as opposed to original intent is so important. What's the, how is the Constitution supposed to be amended? Everybody knows that, right? The, 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 the Constitution specifies how it's supposed to be amended. It doesn't say it's supposed to be amended by lexicographers that, that modified the usage of the English language from one generation to the next, does it? So what, what does this mean? This means that if you're going to properly interpret any statute or any constitutional text, you have to interpret it in the English at the time it was promulgated, adopted, written, published, not modern English. Sometimes words come to mean the opposite of what they once meant. And if you, if you interpret the uh, uh, 18th century text in 21st century English, you're going to get it wrong. <laughs> you're going to be contrary to the intent and the original meaning and everything. So this means that you, that you have to know, well, what did that word mean then? What did the word general mean? The Constitution says that in terms of the preamble to what the powers are, that government has the power to promote the general welfare. What did the word general mean? Universal. That's right. It still means that in math class and in philosophy class and in logic <laughs> class, but that was the way it meant, that's what it meant to the man in the street in 1789. Universal meant zero exceptions. In other words, they didn't want the government doing stuff that private citizens should do or private associations should do. But if the government could do something and it, it didn't hurt anybody, it benefited everybody, then that was okay. If it promoted the general welfare, if it made everybody better off. Now some people say, well, man, that's so strict, the government practically won't be able to do anything. This is about anything you do is gonna hurt somebody. Well, they fixed that. They fixed that with a just compensation clause. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without just compensation. So it doesn't have to benefit everybody. If I can, be, if I can come up with a piece of legislation that's going to benefit everybody in this room but you and you, if the benefit to everybody in this room is great enough that I can take some of that benefit and compensate you two for your loss, then it's constitutional. But if the benefit to the rest of the society is less than the harm it causes you so that I can't even afford to compensate you, then by the general principle it would be unconstitutional. But what does general mean to most people today? Usually, modern English. Usually. That means usually, the majority, in most cases. But that's not what the word meant in the Constitution. The original text of the, of the language. Another, another, another common one is regulate. What does regulated mean? Today people think regulate, oh, that means you, uh, you, you control by statute or by rules adopted pursuant to a statute, you, you govern and control behavior. Well, another word that falls into that category is discipline. Now today, we, com we will commonly see words like discipline and regulate hyphenated, self-discipline. You hear that a lot, self-discipline as opposed to discipline, or self-regulated as opposed to regulated. Well, the way the word regulated was used in 1789 was just the other way around. Somebody said regulated, they meant self-regulated. They said discipline, they meant self-discipline. Discipline wasn't something you did to somebody else. Discipline was something you practiced on yourself. And if they meant discipline by others or regulated by others, then they would hyphenate it or then they would specify what it meant. So, what's a well-regulated militia? Does that mean that it's, you can pass regulations governing what it can and can't do? Or does it mean that it must be 
well-regulated, well-self-regulated, well-self-disciplined, well-trained, whatever you want to call it. That was a common phrase back then, well-regulated in the military terms. Well, it meant that they performed regularly. They knew how to act as a unit, work together in concert. It didn't mean that somebody was standing over here with some regulations telling them what to do. So it's, you, 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 it's very problematic if you, if you use 21st century English to interpret 18th century text. You might as well use French or German or Spanish to interpret 18th century text that sometimes is 21st century English. This puts a great responsibility on us to learn our history and learn the, the history of our, at least our foundational law like the constitutions of our state and our, and our, and our nation. <coughs> Here's another case where uh, the concept of natural law and individual rights would, uh, requires that you vote not guilty, even if the person admits to or is proven beyond a reasonable doubt to have committed the act that he's accused of committing. If the punishment is too severe, if they somebody if, if if they passed you know if the legislature passed a law here in, in Columbia making it a capital crime to uh, plant tulips and in, 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 in walk in front of your house. And somebody planted the tulips, and he admitted that he planted the tulips, and you know, you're sitting on the jury. Are you supposed to find him guilty and then just hope that the judge will have enough sense not to, not to not execute him? Maximum. Or are you supposed to find him not guilty because the punishment for the crime is unnatural? Contrary to natural law, common morality, whatever you want to call it. Um, but if he's planting opium poppies. <laughs> I like that example. I like that example. I like that example. You might, you might, you might have a divergence. Then if he belongs to the CIA in Afghanistan, he would get off. I expect most people might agree about the tools, but you might find some disagreement about the opium poppies. But the important like thing that is that example. even where there's disagreement in our society, if this is a society that holds the individual paramount, in a debate going back to ancient Greece in the time of Aristotle and Plato, where Plato said, a good society, I mean, a, a good citizen is a citizen who lives his life in a way that's good for society. And Aristotle said, no, a good society is a society that's good for individual citizens to live their lives. Two radically different concepts of what the relationship between the individual and, and uh, <coughs> the society are. Well, the American Revolution, if anything else, uh, next to being uh, to implement the concept of the rule of law was to uphold the rights of persons. That word person appears over and over again. In most cases, that you don't even have to be a citizen. Most of the rights in the Constitution aren't rights of citizens, just citizens. they're rights of persons. Like if he's a human being. If you're a person, you got that right. And the founders could speak English, both 20, uh, 18th century English, perfectly well. If, if they meant to say citizen, they would have said citizen. When they meant to say person, they said person. We, got, we, we don't need some juror somewhere saying, oh, they meant to say citizen here when they said person, or they meant to say person here when they said citizen. We have to stick to what the Constitution says. If it says that no person shall be subject to such and such, then it doesn't matter whether you're a citizen or not. If it says no citizen, then that's citizen. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Um, the other one is if the law is vague or obscure. If the law is vague or obscure, then you shouldn't deprive a person of his natural rights, in other words, make him into a criminal, by finding him guilty. And you might think that that is an idea that's itself vague and obscure, and a dangerous one to put in the hand of a juror. There's the old phrase, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, that phrase was born of a day when all the laws that you could be convicted of, uh, turned into a criminal for violating, could fit in one book. Today, there is no lawyer, even in his field of specialty, who knows all the laws, which, if you were to violate, would subject you to criminal prosecution. A personal friend of mine recently wrote another book I want to recommend to you. I, I forgot to bring it or I'd hold it up for you. The title of the book is Three Felonies a Day. The title is an understatement. After you read this book, you will realize that you commit several felonies every day of your life without even knowing it. 
author? Harvey Silverglate. He's one of the attorneys for Martha Stewart. Silverglate? Silverglate. Silverglate. G-L-A-T-E. G-L-A-T-E. Yep. And the title is... I think the subtitle is... Uh, three felonies a day, how the feds target the innocent? Uh, yeah. But it's three, three felonies a day. He's just talking about the federal law. The concept of rule of law, what good is it if, the, if there's so many laws and no human being could possibly know what they are? It's for lawyers. So if the law is so arcane and abstruse yeah, that nobody could ever guess it would be a crime to violate it, and nobody that he spent his life searching through law books could never find that law to find out that it was against that law. And the person hadn't been put on. It's one thing if you, if you pass a law that you know, people would never think of. You catch a person violating that law, and then you warn them. Hey, look, here's the statute. Our legislature said if you do this, you can be found guilty of a crime. And then you persist in doing it. That's one thing. You come up to a person and expect, oh, you should have known that was the law, and put him away, deprive him of his natural rights um, because he didn't know one of the room full of laws that, that he might have violated, it, it, that's another case where you as a juror might decide to vote not guilty. You might say that one of the things that has undermined American uh, freedom in America uh, at both the federal and the state level it's not, it's not that we have legislators that, that make a lot of bad laws. They just make too many. There are too many laws. The concept of rule of law is totally made meaningless when the laws are so numerous and arcane that no reasonable person, maybe no person, period, could ever. The, the director of the Internal Revenue Service has said he himself, it is impossible for him to know when he files his tax return whether or not it is in compliance with the law. law. He, he couldn't possibly know because there's too many laws and regulations that he's supposed to comply with, and he can't even tell. That's just tax law. If the law is incomprehensible, you're sitting there on the jury and you can't figure it out. Even with the judge's help and the help of the prosecutor and the defense attorney, it still doesn't make sense to you. Do you have a right to deprive a person of his life, liberty, or property because it didn't make sense to him either? <laughs> the court misinterpreted the law. The judge told you how to interpret the law, just as Chief Justice Jay did, but then you said, well, even though I respect his opinion, I'm pretty sure he's got it wrong here. Of course, I might be wrong too. But the fact that I might be wrong or the judge might be wrong means there's a reasonable doubt that this person's a criminal. So. How do you vote? Not guilty. The court withheld evidence that might have led you to vote acquittal. Or you as a juror asked for some evidence that would help you decide whether the person was innocent or guilty, and the judge refused to allow you to consider it. That's something you want to think about. That happens in federal courts. It sometimes happens in South Carolina courts. How do you even know that? Because usually the jury doesn't even know it. Well, because a lot of times you're in the room and they start to introduce it and the judge says, oh, stop, going to overrule that. And, 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 and then you come back and all of a sudden the evidence isn't introduced. Yeah, a lot of times you don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm an attorney. I try cases, yes. but not criminal cases. But you know, often the jury really can't know one way or the other from that limited clue. That's right. That, that's why you, you probably know that part of the art as opposed to the science of a defense attorney is to somehow subtly let the jury know that there's something being kept from them. You, you, you go up to where you won't be found in contempt, but you get enough out <laughs> so the jury knows that something's being withheld from them, and sometimes that, that is enough. Um, now, will this result in errors sometimes, and sometimes a guilty person turn free? Yep, it will. But if you want to live in a society, its greatest concern is whether guilty persons go free or whether innocent persons of their life, liberty, and property. So think about a guilty person turned free. If he's a guilty person, he's a criminal, if you don't get him this time, you might get him next time or the time after. But you only have to <clears throat> execute or imprison an innocent person once, and that can never be corrected. Here's another one. Is there a victim? 
person is going to be made a criminal, deprived of his life, liberty, or property. He's a criminal. Whom did he hurt? The judges were too tall. <laughs> is there a victim? If there's no victim, you might want to think about refusing to convict. One of the things about somebody embezzled $100,000 from a bank and then somebody knocked an old lady in the head and stole $15 out of her pocketbook, which is the worst crime? And the answer is knocking the old lady in the head. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, these are, and one, this isn't really another one, but I want to emphasize it in closing. And that is, in light of everything else, one part of the Constitution that every American should study, every potential juror should study, every citizen should study, is the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment is all about due process. That's what, what are the appropriate, as opposed to the inappropriate ways to turn a person into a criminal and deprive him of his life, liberty, and property? And that can be done by anybody. It can be done by a policeman. It can be done by a prosecutor. It can be done by a judge. It can be done by another citizen. But the point is, if the proceeding itself that is designed to put make a criminal, officially a criminal of, of, of someone, in some cases, even if what that person did was wrong, there have been juries that thought that the defendant was guilty of a crime, and, and they would, and they wished that the defendant could be punished. And they were faced with the following choice. Do we punish the guilty person? I can think of one case where I know some jurors thought that the defendant was guilty of murder, and they were convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that he was guilty of murder but they voted not guilty anyway. Because they also thought there was some other guilt. They also thought that the court and the prosecutor were, uh, with the primary the prosecutor, but with the court sanction, were guilty of violating due process. But the prosecution was so zealous to get a conviction that he framed the defendant. Now, this is kind of funny. How do you frame a guilty person? Well, you frame a guilty person by manufacturing false evidence to make sure you get your conviction. So the jury said, we got two wrongs here. A person committed murder, and a prosecutor framed a defendant, who in this case happened to be, I think he happened to be guilty, but if prosecutors can frame defendants, they might frame an innocent defendant someday. So how do I vote? That's an awful tough decision in a murder case. In this case, it involved a crime of passion against a family member, the kind of murders that usually are never, it's not like a you know, stalker or somebody that you're going to do it over and over again. It's the kind of murders that people usually commit once and never commit again, so it made it a little easier for the jury. And in this case, the jury voted for acquittal. And afterwards, several jurors said they were convinced beyond a reasonable doubt he was guilty of murder, but they could not stand by and allow prosecutors to frame defendants. How long ago was that case? Are we talking about a recent case? Or a that was the O.J. Simpson case. <laughs> Everybody tried to, the press tried to make that about race. If they would just pay attention to the few jurors that spoke about it, and what, they would know it wasn't about race. It might have been race, might have been in, in the minds of some of the players, but it wasn't. That wasn't what the verdict was about. They didn't. They, he wasn't. He wasn't uh, acquitted because of his race. Did the judge inform that jury, or did the jury just know? At least one juror just knew because he eventually convinced the other eleven. <laughs> but, but. Uh, that's what happened in that case. And the, and the prosecutors learned a lesson in that case. They've been more careful since then. <laughs> and, and, you know, they, they know that if you, if you get, get a jury thinking that you're goosing the case here and, and, and trumping up stuff to get a conviction, that you might lose your case. And the judge hasn't been sanctioned? The judge hasn't been sanctioned, but I think the prosecutors learned a lesson anyway. Anyway, so in closing, let me just say this. The, if the final thing, if it makes you feel uneasy to say not guilty when you know the person committed the act he was accused of, for any of the reasons mentioned above, just remember what the word guilty means. Guilty doesn't mean responsible for having committed an act. It's improper use of English to say that a person's guilty of having done right, or having done you know, a, a, a proper thing. You're, you're responsible for all actions you take. But responsibility only entails guilt if it's a wrong action. You can't be guilty of a right action. 
So, so it's truthful to say that a person is not guilty if you agree that he did what the people who say he's guilty, you know, say he did, but you just don't think it was wrong. If you don't think it's wrong, then it's not, it's, it's not untruthful. It's not an untruthful verdict, so not guilty. It's not guilty it doesn't mean, yes, you did what they accused you of. It means, yes, you did what they accused you of, and it was wrong. It was illegal. It was unconstitutional. It was immoral. You know? Is that kind of like the hot coffee thing that where the woman... I mean, you can't say that the restaurant <coughs> did anything wrong when they everybody likes their coffee hot, and I just don't think she deserved a lot of money and stuff. I don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't want to characterize that case. I don't know the facts of that case. Uh, she got a hot cup of coffee at McDonald's, put it between her legs, to, and yeah. she. The car pulled out in front of her, she slammed on the brakes and the engine fell, smashed it, it spilled on her lap, burned, third degree burns on her legs. Then she sued because the coffee was too hot. That was the case. Well, I, I, I mean, I know enough about that case to know what you're talking about. What I don't know is what the temperature of the coffee was. Without knowing that, I, I, I still wouldn't want to. Even, even if the temperature were right at the boiling point, which I would consider would make the, the restaurant partly responsible. I would have to think the individual was partly responsible too for putting in a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, so but, the optic difference between talking about the civil cases versus the criminal But that's cases. civil anyway, see? Yeah. In a civil case, you can split the difference. You don't have to say innocent or guilty. You can say, hey, partly responsible here, partly responsible there. That's the beauty of a civil case. And to me, that one of the saddest things about what's gone wrong with our country today of having too many criminal statutes is that I, I think one of the greatest legal systems in the entire world is the American civil courts. But our civil courts have been robbed of jurisdiction because people always want to pass a law to stop this and pass a law to stop that. It's not good enough for them that you, know, you can go to civil court where you can do things like that and you can weigh the pro and the con and come to a very just decision. One of the, one of the examples that, that uh, Senator Goldwater's wife explained to me was a, uh, a person in Colorado uh, uh, who had some grazing land downstream on a river from a plant that was polluting. And they were on the verge of a very successful lawsuit to recover the damages caused to their farmland and their cattle by the pollution in the river. They ultimately failed because somebody came along and made it a crime to pollute the river, and made it a criminal law, and under the criminal law where you paid the criminal tax and you paid your fine to the state and the civil case went down the drain. The government collected some money, but the farmer got nothing. Because of, because of the making it, making it a crime. <laughs> the other side of the issue is like people, somebody went into a 7-Eleven and robbed it. They have a videotape of them. 15 people saw him do it. They all said, that's the guy right there. But because the jury said, well, where's the DNA evidence? What do you mean? Well, there's no DNA evidence, so we're not going to find him not guilty. That, that, that case so they watch much CSI. Of, of what's a reasonable doubt. Although I, I would rather have some circumstantial evidence than eyewitnesses. I, I've seen plenty of situations where, where ten eyewitnesses, and I was one of them, swore we saw something that was later proved to me and the other ten that we were all wrong. I, eyewitness testimony is one of the most unreliable things that, that there is. But, but that's something that you only know by doing scientific studies of it. <laughs> Do you guys still get harassed outside jury rooms when you hand out literature? Well, that's a topic for another, uh, another meeting. Topic. I, I want to say briefly, yes and no, uh, uh, and that is where the current state of the art is today. Yeah. I wanted to get across what the purpose, the mission, and the goal of Fiji was. Anybody interested, give, give me your name, and, uh, and, and if you want, I'll, I'll get a few names together, we get a small group, I'll be perfectly happy to come back and we conduct workshops to, for potential jurors and for defense attorneys too. Uh, and, and we have workshops. How, how, how can a defense attorney get the, you know, the maximum justice for his client without going to jail for contempt? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of really great work. That book has some of it in it, Clay Conrad's book there. Yeah. And uh, another one is, uh, Godfrey Lehman's book on is this any way to run a jury um, and if you just 
write to us and tell us what your interests are. We'll get you in touch with or send you stuff. And some, we have some booklets we can send you. Out sounds well. like to me the judges should get sanctioned. You guys should. They sometimes do, and this is what's happening now. Uh, there have actually been a few judges in the last 10 years or so who have actually tried to turn a clock back to before the William Penn case in England and try to punish jurors. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, we have successfully beaten those cases, gotten those judges overruled. And they will try, but that's why this juror education is so important. The best way to avoid getting hassled is to educate potential jurors. Don't go trying to educate somebody that's already on a jury pool. They'll find some link between you and a defendant and say you're jury tampering, and they might have a case. And I'm always suspicious of somebody who suddenly becomes interested in fully informed juries because he's been convicted of, I mean, because he's been accused of a crime and he's going on trial. Up until then, he wasn't interested, and he never even wanted to serve on a jury. Well, I still want to do what I can to help the person, but still, that's a little late in the day. You don't get to sit on your own jury. So you can't really lay claim to, to enjoying liberty in a free society if you dodge jury duty, either by trying to get out of it when, when, when your name is called, or by not schooling yourself as to what your duties are and think, oh, I'll just wait and let the judge tell me. Are the juries always informed about punishment? No. In, 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 in many federal cases and in some state cases, they even are not allowed to know what the punishment is. Well, there's certain rationales for that, and I don't want to debate the pros and cons of them now, other than to say that it's your absolute right as a juror, if you, in that particular case, if you disagree with it, and, and the Supreme Court has upheld it many times again, it's your absolute right to acquit, regardless. Well, that's right. That was one of your yeah, reasons. Yeah, and that was one of the points. There are cases where, you, where, where you're, you're not allowed to know. They try in those cases, as, as this gentleman pointed out, to make sure that you don't even know that, you're, <laughs> that it's being hidden from you. Uh, sometimes you do know it's being hidden from you. And sometimes you can tell by the way you're questioned as a juror. And another question that's related to what you ask is, when you're called for jury duty, you're asked some questions. And sometimes you can tell that those questions are designed to screen you out. Um, when when FIJA was first formed, I, I became a member of FIJA. I'm no longer a member. I'm not a member. And I don't recommend anybody become a member. In fact, we pretty much abolish the status of membership. That way, no judge can say, are you a member of the fully informed jury association? <laughs> 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 you can say it, but you can truthfully say no. We don't have members. <laughs> you don't have members. Yeah. Right. Maybe it's just me, but I don't like the idea of you serve on the jury, like the OJ Simpson jury. They sit you up there, the jurors up there, and have them discuss what went on or why they felt. Who does that? Well, the news media. Oh, yeah. Or, to, me, in court, to me, what went on in that jury room, in that jury room, should stay in that jury room. I think there's a rationale in favor of that. In some cases, like in, the, in some cases, the jurors might. Jurors, I, th I think that should be left up to the jurors, to be honest with you. It is, isn't it? Yeah. I, and, and, now, now, then the problem arises if some jurors <coughs> want to keep it in the jury room and some And in that case, I don't think that society can prescribe a solution. Sometimes we just have to learn how to get along with each other. I think it's up to the jurors. To, if I were sitting on a jury and it was a tough case and we reached the verdict, and wait a minute now, before we tell the judge what our decision is, I want to discuss one more thing. What are we going to do when we leave here? when we get asked questions. And I think the jurors should try to reach a, a gentleman's agreement among the gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen's agreement among themselves as to what they will and won't say when they leave the courtroom. But you're not required to say anything to anybody, including the judge, when you leave the courtroom. And anybody who requires you to say anything is violating your rights. Well, I don't think they require them, but I mean, yeah. they, they do it. And I, I understand. Like it. Well, it just depends on whether they're planning to want Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we got time for one more question. Uh, have you both had a question or? Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm very concerned because I can see that originally the juries were intended to have a lot of um, credibility. And or as Jefferson so said, the fourth branch of government. <laughs> but in today's world, and I understand about the number of court cases that are brought and, and all of that. But it is virtually impossible to get a civil case to court anymore because 
companies. <laughs> and the insurance companies um, are able to manipulate the system, in my opinion, where nothing ever goes to a jury. Well, but, 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 but that, strictly speaking, it isn't a violation of your rights because you're supposed to read something before you sign it. And the contract with the insurance company that you voluntarily signed and supposedly read, uh, most insurance companies uh, require you to give them the right to make the decision. So if they decide it's cheaper to admit you were wrong and pay, on your behalf, admit you were at fault and pay, then it would be, even if they think you're correct and they think that they could win, but they know that the court case will cost them more and there's no chance of recovering from the other side, in the interest of their stockholders, they settle. settle. And eliminate. Now, if insurance. they didn't do that, insurance would cost more. And, and presumably, if, although not in South Carolina, because unfortunately South Carolina controls the insurance industry so much, there's a lot of things you can't do in South Carolina. Like, for example, I can't buy health insurance that I want in South Carolina because South Carolina has made it legal to discriminate against people over the age of 65 who want to buy straight private insurance. They don't want some supplemental Medicare. I don't want to burden my grandchildren with the cost of medical care. I got, I got zapped. They took my money. They didn't put it in trust. They spent it. It's gone. It's like I was a victim of theft. I don't have a right to make my grandchildren suffer the cost of that I'm a victim of theft. I'm going to have to give. If they want to help me, fine. But I'm not going to force them to do it. So I don't want. I, I refuse to be a Medicare. I'm a, I'm a conscientious objector to being part of Medicare. But I have I have to take up residence someplace else to buy medical insurance because in South Carolina I can't legally get medical insurance. They allow insurance companies in South Carolina say if you're over 65. We'll only sell you supplemental medical care. We won't, we won't continue the policy. Actually, I understand I'm getting older. You might want to raise the premium. That's okay. But I want, I want to keep my policy. Nope, we're not going to keep it. Why? Because you you turn 65. Isn't that age discrimination? Yeah, but it's legal because the South Carolina legislature made it legal. Ron, ah. here's a short question. <laughs> yeah. If you have a... Uh, capital case or a uh, felony case and the person is, con is uh, found guilty and the jurors are allowed to go out and run their mouth, isn't that detrimental to a, uh, an appeal? Hmm. Well, that's complicated. I think the answer would depend on the particulars. <coughs> um, the particular is you have been convicted of capital. But there's no way you can stop them because just like you can't require a juror to say anything, you can't stop them from saying anything either. And even though that can cause problems. Even if you went, you went free, but you were going to do a civil yeah. case, yeah, like, if they discuss all of that, it can harm the chances. The government is so all-powerful that, as George Washington said, we need to keep it on a short leash. They and were, we're out of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>